it's interesting just listening to your volunteer or, uh, or your stewardship meeting here talking about the different landowners. Um, the pine bush is also um, has multiple landowners. It's uh, part owned by the town of uh, Colony in Gilderland, the city of Albany, the Nature Conservancy, um, the state of New York DEC, and then New York State Parks, another state agency, and then the Mohawk Hudson Land Conservancy. And um, the um, organization that manages it is the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission, which uh, manages it on behalf of everybody. Uh, the employees that work there are um, employees of the state were like public, uh, public authority. Um, so we're like three-way employees. Um, anyway, all that gobbledygook. It's kind of a confusing mess of uh, <laughs> jurisdictions and ownerships, although we don't have to deal with the hurdles like you were talking about with uh, only being allowed to do certain things on certain parcels. Uh, we're allowed to manage the entire property, although there is some permitting involved. Um, so protected in 88 by the New York State Legislature, it's a... Um, um, a giant glacial deposit of sand. Um, you may be familiar with Glacial Lake Albany was in this part of the, the country. And um, when the glaciers receded, they uh, deposited a, a large amount of sand in the region in general, but uh, in particularly in that area between Schenectady and Albany, there's a dune field there. Um, so, um, the habitat there is um, a inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens, and um, it looks very similar to um, Cape Cod, if you've ever been out there, or Eastern Long Island, or the New Jersey pine barrens, which is uh, like the, the entire southeast portion of the state of New Jersey. Theirs are very flat, but that kind of area near Atlantic City, it looks like that. Um, just scooped up and dropped inland. And it, the reason it's there is because the, uh, the sandy acidic soils, uh, it's hard for things to grow there. And a bunch of fire dependent species um, have persisted and thrived there. Um, pitch pine, um, scrub oak, huckleberry, blueberry. Um, so there's a, an overstory of, of oak trees and pitch pines. And then an under, under that, there's a shrub component, which is scrub oak. And then underneath that, um, heaths, which is the uh, huckleberry and blueberry. There's also prairie grasses there, um, big blue stem, little blue stem, and Indian grass. I don't know the scientific names. Um, and a lot of these species um, uh, have survival mechanisms, so they, they actually benefit from the disturbance of fire. Um, so uh, pitch pine trees um, uh, have thick flaky bark. The adult trees can withstand the heat of a fire. They don't get gurgled by it. Um, they can also re-sprout um, from the base or from the, the trunk of the tree. Um, and uh, uh, the grasses I mentioned um, um, really do <laughs> quite well with burning. They do a lot of burning in the Midwest. Um, and uh, um, oak leaf litter burns very well. So th there's documented history of fires happening before uh, European settlement. And uh, basically, when the pine bush became a thing, they started the program in uh, 1991. So they've been doing prescribed fire ever since then. Um, we have had some zero years. The most we've ever burned in a year is, is 18 days. So, um, in the, so we've go from zero acres to the most we've burned in a season is, uh, like 423 acres. So we try and burn, um, 10% of the preserve, um, in a given year. And, uh, those burns, if, you, if, uh, if we looked at it on a chart, there would be a, a peak in the spring, and uh, that's the spring dormant season. So our season basically starts um, around St. Patrick's Day when we get snow melt down in Albany. And um, 
the spring dormant season is basically the end of March, April, May, and uh, by the first week of June, we're typically in, in full leaf out uh, and into the growing season down there. Um, but in between that time of snow melt and full leaf out, uh, so there's, there's longer days and sunlight hits the forest floor and dries out all the dead organic vegetation. Um, historically, that's when most of the wildfires did happen in this region. And then uh, it coincides with our, with our burning. We do most of our burning in those months. Um, we do burn into the summer um, in, in the growing season. Um, the growing season would be uh, basically from uh, June till uh, the end of September. And then in the fall, we have a shorter dormant season once the leaves start falling again. Uh, and that goes to December and we don't have a heated facility. So we winterize our equipment um, when everything um, well, when everything starts freezing. Um, it's a little harder to burn in the fall because the, the angle of the sun is so low and the days are shorter. And we no normally get full recovery at night, so they'll be due. And then you have to wait for that to evaporate. And um, there's just not as much opportunity in the fall dormant season. Um, and uh, that's just because of, uh, well, the stuff I was talking about with the length of day and all that. Um, let's see, also about the burn program, so before we burn, and this is happening now, um, I um, grab the addresses of everybody that lives within a mile of the um, management units we want to burn, and uh, we send them a postcard letting them know that we're coming into our burn season and they can get put on a notification list if, they'd, uh, if they want to be notified before burns happen. The notification process is quite lengthy. Just, to go, just like last year, I finally got them to move to an email notification list because like literally it was, uh, if I was doing it myself, it's like three hours of phone calls. The, the list had grown so much because like there's 7,000 postcards go out. <laughs> like, it just got to be too much notification, but we have to call a ton of people before we burn. Um, either the day before or the morning of. So we notify the airport, um, county, um, state police, the city dispatch, and then those two towns I mentioned, um, and then all the uh, public officials need to know. Um, I have two positions I hire. Uh, seasonal firefighters, they come on in April and they're with me till um, Till around uh, Halloween and uh, and there's a couple other staff members at the Pine Bush that are trained in wildland firefighting uh, but really we rely mostly on volunteers and agency partners uh, so some of our biggest partners would be the New York State DEC and in particularly the forest rangers we have a good relationship with them they actually leave their region type um, we're in region four you guys are up in five here uh, the Mohawks, the boundary there is Saratoga County, but they keep their uh, Type 6 and Type 7 engines at the Pine Bush. Those are small brush trucks that um, we use in the field. And then the Nature Conservancy also lets us use their Type 6 engine. Um, and then the Pine Bush owns three UTVs, and those are like side-by-sides, which have 75 to 100 gallon tank on the back. Um, so New York State Forest Rangers, DEC in general, there's other people that would, with different jobs within DEC that participate on the fires. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, sometimes they come out and assist and will assist them as well. So I'll take my crew and help them burn um, when they burn in the Shawgunks or out at Iroquois, out in Western New York. Um, the National Park Service, we, we have an MOU with the Saratoga Battlefield I know the guy that burns up there, they're, they're, they always come up with their crew and help us, at least for a couple. And um, I love burning at Saratoga because of the his historical significance there, but through knowing this guy, Matt, he actually invited me uh, um, a couple years ago. I got the opportunity to go help them burn in Gettysburg and when, when we burned the Little Round Top Battlefield, which is very cool. Um, but National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and then um, 
the Nature Conservancy, those are our biggest partners, um, New York State Parks, the commission members I, I mentioned earlier. And then we get kind of interest from local fire departments. Um, I teach the uh, introduction to wildland firefighting class each April. Um, and we do that in partnership with the forest rangers. So the way people get certified is you go through some online coursework, you do that at your own pace, and then you attend a field day, which we have the second Saturday in April. And um, uh, so that's kind of, and that always creates new people. That's kind of how we have uh, a crew. And uh, so we have to have a minimum of 10 firefighters there to have a burn. Um, and that's kind of how the, the burns are made up. Uh, let's see, the, um, <coughs> that's kind of how we do the notification. Oh, and then um, when we implement the burns, basically we're, we have um, accepted weather parameters. Those are kind of the rules we have to play within that are approved by the state. So each, within the preserve, it's, it's broken up into um, management units, we call them. Uh, so we use like the trail network like you guys have here and then we break up the the landscape um, with smoke management in mind so um you want to um, burn on days where you're pushing the smoke um away from smoke sensitive areas so there's um if you've ever been to the pine bush uh i'm sure it's it, i think it's the same here too it's a mosaic of parcels yeah it's not a contiguous chunk of land, so the 3,500 acres is, is broken up. Uh, there's like a couple hundred acres here. Um, like the, the throughway basically bisects it. Um, so it's broken up by road, roads, railroads, um, and in uh, each area has its own unique kind of circumstance. So some of the management units are rather small, and that's it depends on where they are in relation to smoke sensitive areas. You'll, you want to have some, some wind to push it away from, from some place that you don't want to hit with smoke, but you, you also don't want overpowering wind that'll shear the smoke column off and blow it into um, residential areas. There's a lot of nursing homes and stuff like that. <coughs> so I'm looking for dry, sunny days um, with low humidities and a light wind and um, th those are the main components. So there's relative humidity, sunshine makes a big deal, um, and wind. Um, so that's kind of how I plan the burn days. Uh, we never burn more than a, a third of a subpopulation of carners at a time. So we always leave two thirds of their habitat unburned so they can, that's the refuge for them so they can re repopulate the area that was burned. Um, and, uh, well, you guys know with, with the looping up here, it loves its sunlight. So, um, they, it really likes being burned or mowed, but anything I, it comes up in the fire breaks that we mow with the tractor too, like all the time. Um, so that's kind of it about why we burn, how the pine bush started, and then like what kind of goes into it, uh. I'd be happy to answer any questions about any kind of well, aspect. Obviously, we mow, we mow here. Yeah. Don't burn. And was that, do you know if that decision was just made because people didn't want fires in their backyard? Or? Uh, that decision was made by Melissa, who's the head of our area of Region 5. We have the rangers to burn who are qualified, but she decided that it was more of a risk than it was a benefit. And the, um, I guess, what is the benefit? Obviously, I know the burn and it gets everything reset and starts over again. Mowing is not as effective as that. Or is the, the butterfly, uh, the plant, the butterfly, uh, they care? Or? Well, um, they die during the fire. Yeah. Um, although, though, they care. It, when you, depending on like what the what the conditions are like, like you, it doesn't always burn the same. Sometimes the burn itself is a mosaic so it's not burned black from fire break to fire break mm -hmm. we're looking to mimic low intensity ground fires uh so what we're doing with the fires is we're we're top killing um woody plants is what we're trying to do so mm -hmm. all the saplings that are coming up we want to we want to kill those right. with fire allow sunlight to hit the forest floor 
and the lupin will come back out again. So we're burning, not necessarily fields, we're burning in the woods as well. If we get a hot enough burn, we, um, well, we, we will till in our seed mix. So we gather native seed from the preserve. So we're gathering lupin seed every year. Um, and in addition to lupin, we gather a bunch of native um, flowers. So butterfly milkweed, mm -hmm. a New Jersey tea, horse mint, bush clover. Um, there's a whole host of those we gather in addition to those prairie grasses. And uh, we'll till that in after a fire. So we're expanding uh, not just the Carner's habitat, but the Carner and the whole, mm -hmm. we're, we're expanding um, this uh, dispersal of those species but through fire. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we do mow down there too. Uh, um, some of the growing season burns that we do are mowing burns, is what we call them. So we, we mow the scrub oak layer down this time of year when the ground is frozen. And then we burn that in the growing season and scrub oak, um, it's a shrub layer, but like what, when you mow it down, you, you will mow it down when it's like 10 feet high and you reduce the shrub to basically a pile of kindling um, throughout the area that you're looking to burn. And then when you burn that, um, it consumes all that organic vegetation. The scrub oak will re-sprout, re um, but it's, it's a kind of a safe way to burn off that uh, fuel um, with less chance of it slopping out of the unit or throwing spot mm -hmm. fires. And that's because when you're burning it in the growing season, only the mowed fuel is burning. basically available to right. burn. And it burns very slow and hot. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll, so we do a lot of mowing <clears throat> there too, um, but we all often pair it with burning. Mm -hmm. How do you control, yeah. this may be very elementary, how do you control the burns? <laughs> oh yeah, so, um, those management units that I was talking about. So like we, um, we have a network of fire breaks. So fire breaks can be like existing roads or trails mm -hmm. or a mode path through the woods. Uh, and then um, if it's a, if it, ideally those go down to mineral soil. Um, so what you'll do is like, so we'll have this area that we want to burn say it's got a drivable trail all the way around it. You start at the downwind side, so the direction that the wind's blowing towards, and you position your, your equipment and crew there, and you have what's called a test fire, and that's an opportunity um, for me to, uh, so I'm, I'm the burn boss, so I'm running the, the incident there. So um, I'll observe the fire and make a decision on whether or not we're meeting objectives what, whether or not it's consuming. So maybe it's too wet and we're like, oh, it's not worth it today. Or, or maybe it's, uh, it's burning really hot. And I'm like, well, this is um, going to be a problem for us containing it. But basically you do a test fire on the downwind side and then you start burning along your fire breaks. So you burn along the trails. And then the more that fire backs into the wind, the greater distance an ember has to go to a spot outside of the unit. So you, you start, um, burning on your downwind side and then you you work into the wind so um if you could picture it like just like a square you'd start at the downwind side you start a test fire and then you'd start burning along each fire break and then you almost like color into the wind so by coloring into the wind that would be there would be igniters firefighters with trip torches and um they're they're setting the um the dead organic fuel on fire in the unit um, working towards the wind and eventually you'll you'll finish the unit that way so i should have mentioned that earlier the uh the fires are started by um we use drip torches and that's um it's a fuel canister it's not like a torch in the sense that it's shooting anything out it's a it's a mixture of diesel and gasoline three parts diesel to one part gas and uh, it, you pour it over a drip torch, which, which has a wick that's burning on the end of it. And um, that'll light the leaf litter and needle cast on fire. Um, so that's how we're, how we're burning it. How, yeah, so we're controlling it by basically starting on the downwinds. It starts on the preparation process. So you want to 
create the fire break, um, which could be a road or a trail. Um, you, if it doesn't go down to mineral soil, you can do what's called a wet line. And uh, that's when you have a uh, engine and you, you wet down the vegetation within the fire break, um, like say three feet wide, and then you have the igniter light right on the, the in-unit side of the, uh, the um, vegetation and it won't burn across that because it's just been wet down. Although it takes some like <laughs> coordination because you don't want the wet line to get too far in front of the igniter because it'll evaporate. Um, or, and the, uh, it need, there needs to be adequate water put down. You can't, you can't, so like it takes some time to get it right, but that's basically how the burns go. So I'll, um, I'll look ahead. I'll be like, hey, next week. So that, that so I have an email list of volunteers and partners. So I'll say, hey, next week, Tuesday and Wednesday look like a potential burn day. I send out um, a list that you can sign up if you're interested. And then the day before the burn, I'll make a go or a no go call on it. So I'll say, and I typically do that 24 hours before the burn, but I'll send it before noon that day. And I'll say, hey, the uh, weather looks good. We're a go for tomorrow give them the briefing time and location, they come out and then we go out to the unit or we'll have a briefing and we'll go out uh, in our PPE, um, do the test fire and then if that's a go, then we, then we burn through the unit. That's kind of how that goes. And then we mop it up afterwards, which is uh, extinguishing any smoldering um, vegetation or duff, which is the decaying organic layer on top of the ground. Um, the day that you set the fire? Yeah, and that can be a real pain too because uh, you just spent all this time setting this this land on fire and it, ecologically it'd be nice to just let it smolder, but like unfortunately, as soon as you get to dusk, uh, you lose all of your lift and the smoke that's there stays and it'll settle. Uh, if there's no wind, it'll just kind of go downhill and, and settle in areas and it can make a uh, visual hazard for motorists. It, can also irritate the public quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah, Lily. Do you have certain areas that you target the burns, or is the goal that like all the acreage will get burned in the next ten years or however many? We we have uh, so with those management units, we, we have certain areas that we, we target. So we we want to burn the grasslands and um, basically every one to three years for the for the barrens, which would be um, more um, more pitch pot, or uh, more scrub oak component, uh, we want to burn that every three to five years, and then the forested areas we can burn every one to ten years. So everything's kind of on a schedule, um, but um, the schedule fluctuates based on what's in the unit and how it burned the last time, how how the vegetation has responded. Um, the prevalence of um, endangered species like harners and then invasive species concerns. So there's a lot of other kind of factors that go into when it next gets burned, but we try and hit everything um, basically every one to 10 years. Although there's still a ton of places that haven't been burned within it. The, the whole footprint of the preserve has not been burned yet. Yeah. Is burning specific to sort of sand dune or sand plain habitat, or do you burn in other kinds of habitats? Um, well, one thing the pine bush is pretty cool about is uh, if we're not burning here, they, they'll, they'll send me to go burn other places. Um, so um, other places in the, it, it's weird, it's kind of a niche thing in the Northeast. Uh, most of the burning that's done in New York is mostly done on sandy soils, but it's not always the case. Um, uh, so down in Long Island, it's, it's sandy, it's pitch pine scrub oak barrens out there. The Saratoga battlefield is not sandy, but they're burning for different objectives. That's like for historical preservation. The um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service mainly burns wetland grass is what they're burning. That's not, not on sand, but that area I mentioned is over by Batavia, Iroquois National Wildlife Refuge. Um, been out there to help them a number of times. Uh, and then Shawgunk, which is uh, downstate. Uh, they used to burn at um, 
and it catches fire on its own all the time. But the the Shawdong Ridge, if you're familiar with it down by New Paltz, um, that's that's uh, not sandy soil, but it's it's, it's rocky soil that drains fast. Um, they that I've been on a, a, in 2015. There was a big fire down there called the Rosa Gap Fire that was like 3,000 acres. New York rarely gets campaign fires. Most of them are put out in one operational period. But um, that that fire down there, and then the year <coughs> after 2016, the Sands Point fire was like 2,600 acres. Um, and then there's a place, Flat Rock Preserve, or a state forest up near Plattsburgh, that um, is also rocky uh, soils. We find similar habitats or similar species living there. Is your background uh, uh, environmental or uh, firefighting? Uh, I got no. I, I, uh, I actually, when you mentioned GIS, I, I went to school for geography. So I, my background is in uh, geographic information systems. So that's uh, computer mapping. Um, I, I didn't expect to hear so much about the whole firefighting and incident command. Oh, <laughs> oh I, well, no, no, I mean, it's, 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 so it's, I go out it's west. what I didn't expect, but, but it's, it makes complete sense. So my fire credentials is I'm a, I'm a crew boss, engine boss, firing boss. I like the term boss. <laughs> and wildfire, <laughs> the incident commander type four, and I'm a burn boss type two. So I do go out west, um, is a second job. So I'll take vacation time from the pine bush and I'll sign up. To go on a hand crew, um, mostly with the state of New York. Um, I've been to Oregon, California, Washington, Montana a couple times. Um, and that's the only way you move up in wildland firefighting um, credentials. So you have to perform, um, it, it's a task book, so it's kind of like an apprenticeship. So in order to move up, you start as a firefighter type two, you have to take classes, but then you have to perform this task book, um, and there's W tasks that can only be done on wildfires. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of my background with wildfire. Yeah? This might be like a stupid question, but no. like, what do you do if there's like a natural fire? Do you let it kind of just take its course and then like re-evaluate which parts or areas need to burn? Or like, what do you do? So, um, if it was at the pine bush, it would be suppressed immediately. Um, depending on where the fires are out west, some of the fires, and this is more of a newer thing, um, depending on where it's burning, sometimes they'll let it go, um, especially if it's burning in a wilderness area and not really threatening anything. Um, but that would be up to the national forest that it was on. Um, so there are some fires that they're like, hey, this isn't, kind of depends on where it is and what the weather conditions are, but some of them they'll let go and be like, we're going to no, not suppress this. We're just going to let it burn till snowfall. I, I was actually on a fire in Montana that uh, they just wanted to keep it from coming down into this town of Eureka. And um, so we were doing work down there, but they were not worried about it burning towards Glacier National Park because there was... There was no homes, there was nothing in that direction. So they were kind of just keeping an eye on it and just working one side of the fire. So sometimes they let it go, but most of the time they, they put it out. Pretty much everything in New York there is gonna put out that they can. Yeah, oh yeah, in New York it would, it would be put out. And that wouldn't be up to me, that would be up to the local fire chief and th they, they would put it out there because there's too much um, lives and, and property that could get hurt if, if you yeah, let it go. I, I studied um, pine barrens in Jersey, and a lot of the times they kind of just like hope that it happens on its own and kind of let it go, so I wasn't sure if it was the same pine barrens. No, uh, well, they, they have a lot more fires down there. They're, 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 their pine barrens is huge. Uh, I know, they, I think they had a 10,000 acre fire just this past spring, mm -hmm. um, but they're more prone to, to frequent fires. Yeah. So is um, like wildfire management and just wildfire dry burns more frequent on the East Coast than you think? Because you always hear about like big wildfires and frequent fires in the West, but not so much talked about east of the Mississippi. It's different. So like in Pennsylvania, they do a lot of prescribed fire. They they burn um, uh, 
like the Pennsylvania Fish and Game Commission burns over 10,000 acres a year. Like I was saying, we did like 320 acres last year, which is big for our small area, but like other adjacent states burn a lot more. Massachusetts um, burns um, a lot more than New York. A lot of those are, are close closer to their Pine Barrens, which is in the eastern part of the state, but you can see them up through, um, up through uh, the western part as well. Um, before we do a burn, you have to submit like a spot weather forecast that you get from the National Weather Service. So it's a specialized forecast basically for your burn area. But when you go on that page and submit it, um, we typically have the same weather or same burn windows as the other places in the region. Um, but like, so when I submit my spot, I can look and you'll see all the dots of everywhere where that prescribed fires are happening. Um, Green Mountain does a little bit. Uh, same in New Hampshire with the White Mountains, not a, not a ton. Maine, the, but the, there is prescribed fire happening in all those states. Just um, not a ton. We don't have the, the giant landscape that they do out west that's prone to fire because of the vegetation and the arid nature of their climate. But, uh, but it, it does happen. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's say if you just mowed, but you didn't burn, would the debris that's left there enrich the soil through decay and eventually start to change the ecosystem a little bit? I don't know if it would it would enrich the soil. Um, I don't know uh, um, if it would change the ecosystem. I know that, um, although I believe it, it, I don't know. I don't know that how um, how different it would be. You're talking about for mowing your lupin uh, instead of burning it? Yeah, because uh, up here, um, the reason why a lot of the scrub and the shrubs are mowed is to make sure that the lupines and the grasses keep growing. Otherwise, the uh, forest would reclaim it in a matter of decades. Um, well, yeah, you can mechanically treat it. Um, burning is expensive. You have to, we have to get insurance for that. Um, and uh, you have to bring on, if, you, if you're looking to hire just to contract burn a site, like it can cost quite a bit of money. Uh, there's a company now that does it um, out of New Jersey. Um, and I think they charge like, Twenty thousand dollars per burn around that, like just per burn. To if you're having them come up and be the crew and everything, but and and, and there's liability involved with burning it. So like, um, a mowing could just be more of a cost-effective way to maintain that. Basically, when you're when you're burning, you're you're doing the same thing as the mower and they, the mowers top killing everything yeah. the fire top kills everything the fire consumes all that or sometimes a lot of that dead organic if it doesn't do it on the first burn the second burn uh, sometimes can be more hot because the um, you'll have the skeleton of the tree or the shrub that was top killed and then five years later when you come back to burn that site you'll haul up all that uh, dead um, material in addition to the regen and sometimes <coughs> um, that can make the, the second entry fire in a, in a location hotter. Um, but I don't know your answer, uh, the answer to your question with the, with the soil chemistry. In fact, there's just a lot of uh, leaves and a lot of twigs that were just breaking down and decaying with that start turning so into like some really nice organic matter that would, would like up. I think it would enrich the soil for sure. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know if it would, if, if how it would change it over time. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. Covered is there anything in it that's similar to what Thomas was asking? So what, what is the reason? What are the benefits, cost benefits of mowing versus burns? And this has been prescribed for burning since 1991. Do they ever reevaluate the, the proportions or? Um, well, they, uh, they do a lot of, um, monitoring of how the wildlife responds to the management. Um, so, uh, mowing, doing the mowing that, that you're talking about, I don't think would be, um, practical for the kind of landscape that it, that the pine bush is with all the dunes and stuff. Um, 
in addition, because we're burning into the, the forest and barrens kind of, uh, this is more oak savanna and not as much pine barrens, I believe, up here. Um, so it's a different species composition. And um, some of the species I mentioned before, like they, even though individuals may die, they, they like, they exist in areas that are prone to frequent wildfire. But uh, we do do mowing, um, especially in, in areas that we can't get in to burn because it's in a really tight spot that we want to keep the lupin there. We'll come in and, and mow it as well. So an area that's like right by the mall or right by a nursing home or just some of the places are just are just hard to set on fire. Yeah. Have we ever burned here? Like 15 not years that ago? I know of. I know. Not in the past mm -hmm. six years. Well, definitely not in the past six years. That's according For to For some Aaron's reason, I have something stuck in my head that we did like a long time ago. Another, I'll just mention, this is not pine bush, but um, if uh, you may have heard about it, but um, there's a uh, another location um, just north of Moreau State Park, right near exit 17N, going towards Glens Falls. Um, if you look on Google Maps and turn on the satellite view, there's a peninsula um, the along the Hudson River there that's going to be Big Bend Big Boom Preserve, which is going to be part of uh, Moreau uh, State Park. So State Parks is, is, is doing this, but they, they scored this site um, for its potential um, to basically, it, the, this is gonna be the fourth recovery site for the Carners. So right now, they're, the, that was a Finch Prime parcel. I've, I've walked that. Yeah, yeah. so uh, then the Open Space Institute. Yeah, um, they have very, that. very ominous signs, like no trap. But if you read it, it's like public welcome, but it, well, it, looks, <laughs> like, it looks like those there to me. <laughs> so, they're looking to, to burn there, uh, so that they did a thinning project and um, uh, they're treating some invasive species, but they have plans to basically um, start burning that and planting lupin there. And then that'll be the most northern um, recovery site for the Carners in New York. So they're here, they're in the pine bush, they're gonna be up there, here in the airport as well. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't think Wilton's burned before. Uh, Maybe it was a maybe it was a natural one. <laughs> well, uh, actually, I'm sure it's burned at some point uh, uh, through a natural caused fire, human caused fire, at some point in time. Anybody got uh, any other questions about pine bush or fire? Um, Super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank no. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody's interested um, in um, getting trained in wildland firefighting, um, I can leave a card. You can just send me an email here. Um, it's just my first initial and last name, so it's T Briggs at albanypinebush.org. Um, and you have my email. Yeah, here. I can pass it to anybody who wants to. Let's pass this around if you want to take a picture of it. Go for it. But uh, we partner with the Forest Rangers to put that class on um, uh, every year. So if you ever get the hankering that you want to get certified in it, uh, you can just shoot me an email. I'll send you the links to the classes. And then... Uh, um, uh, I'll put you on the burn crew list. You have to pass a physical fitness test, which is not hard. Uh, um, if you just want to burn at the pine bush, the moderate pack test is um, a two mile hike with a uh, 25 pound backpack and you have to do that in 30 minutes. So it's 15 minute mile pace. And then if you want to be able to fight fires out of state, um, the arduous pack test is a three mile hike with a 45 pound backpack and you have to do that in 45 minutes. So it's again, it's at that 15 minute mile pace. It's enough to make you sweat, but it's not like grueling. Although it will give you shin splints. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Lily, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. This yeah. was awesome. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, yeah it's got a really cool spot up here. Yeah. And it's neat hearing about similar work done than other places. It's so interesting to compare what it's like up here to down there since we've been, you know, we mow and have mowed for years. I think the last fire up here was like an accidental spark that came off the railroad, you know, 20 plus years ago. So thank you. So it's really interesting to hear about not only how it gets done, but you know, what it looks like after. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And um, the DEC, they're, they're the people that make the rules, but basically, if you ever wanted to start, you'd have to submit a burn plan to them. And, uh, and um, Jamie Lasko, who's the Region 5 captain, he's also the state um, fire supervisor, is a really nice guy. Um, uh, and he's, he's super supportive of fire, so it, you guys are close to the cash, too. Uh, they, the Saratoga tree nursery is where they keep all like their cache of engines and stuff like that. <laughs> well, if you did have a wildfire, they'd be right there. But there's also they're they're highly trained. The forest rangers are, and they're great help to have on the burns. That'd be a dream if we could start burning here. We'll see. Well, you ever want to talk about more? I'd be happy to talk on the phone. My house is only a few hundred yards away. Well, actually, coming down. <laughs>